All right, great. Um, well, good morning and welcome to the Build Ready Program Step 1 Proposers Webinar. Um, we're happy to have you here today. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Sal to please go to the next slide. Great. Um, so before we get started, I uh, just want to go over some housekeeping rules. Um, so all of you um, who are joining us today are muted. Um, we will be taking questions and um, comments in writing through the Q&A feature, um, which you'll see um, on the sidebar or of your WebEx. Um, so please uh, submit your questions. Um, we will do our best to answer them during the webinar. If we're not able to answer them during the webinar today, we will be posting um, a Q&A um, from this webinar um, in the next couple of days, and we'll be circulating that along with the webinar recording and webinar slides. Um, also want to let you know the chat is disabled. Um, and like I said, we'll be circulating all the information after this webinar and also I'll be posting it to the Build Ready RFP website. Um, and if you have any technical problems while we are um, going through the webinar, please reach out to um, our colleague Sal Graven and his email is here. Next slide, please. Great. So today you're going to be hearing from a few different members of um, the large scale renewables group at NYSERDA and the Build Ready program. Um, I'm Emily Chesson. I'm the Build Ready program manager. Um, you'll also be hearing from George Sassine, uh, the vice president of uh, large scale renewables, um, the Build Ready director, Gillian Black, um, Bram Peterson, who is uh, the program manager of large scale renewables, and also um, our associate counsel, uh, Nathaniel Chumley. Um, so we'll start with some welcoming remarks um, from our vice president, uh, George. We'll then uh, provide a little bit more information on the Build Ready program but for those of you that might be new to the program and just to provide a refresher. Um, we'll then transition into speaking uh, about the Benz of Mines project that we are currently um, issuing this request for proposals for. Um, we'll then walk through the RFP, go over the step one application um, and the submission process, uh, review our uh, next steps of dates, and then also um, after that, go into the step two um, process and review the next steps and changes associated with uh, step two. So with that, um, I'd like to go to the next slide. I'll pass it over to George. Thank you, Emily. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and thank you for your interest in the very first build ready uh, project rec request for proposals. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Um, as you know, the build ready program is truly unique. Uh, it's a unique program that New York is spearheading to advance large scale renewable projects on underutilized land. And, you know, these could be brownfields, landfills, um, you know, abandoned or existing commercial and industrial sites and parking lots. And what the Build Ready program does is we would identify and de-risk these projects uh, and we would carry out, you know, the design, engineering, environmental permitting, electric grid interconnection activities, and develop host community benefit packages. Uh, and after we do all this work and de-risk the projects, this program runs competitive solicitations like this one, like this RFP that we're talking about today. And we would transfer these projects to the private sector uh, which will be then responsible for the final design, financing, construction, ownership, and operation of the projects. And uh, through the Build Ready program, you know, NYSERDA would then procure the Tier 1 RECs created through the production of renewable energy from, from the Build Ready project. So it's a very unique program, uh, and we're very thrilled to launch the very first Build Ready RFP. And this solicitation is for the Benson Mines solar project, which is a 12 megawatt solar facility located in the St. Lawrence County and is sited within the boundaries of uh, Benson Mines, which is on a former iron ore dating spile. Uh, and once it's op operational, it would be one of the largest solar PV facilities located within the Adirondack Park. And frankly, I think as a very first build ready RFP, this is really, th this project is really uh, the poster child of what the build ready program um, ought to be doing. And we're, you know, it's the first of many RFPs to come. So we're very excited to see, you know, uh, 
all your participation in this web webinar. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, different uh, stakeholders here, whether they're existing tier one contractors, uh, existing New York Sun contractors, and even some new companies that are looking to, to operate in New York. So, you know, here at NYSERDA, we're really aiming to generate as much interest as possible in the solicitation and facilitate a competitive process to select the best partner possible to the state to finalize the development of this project and secure financing and build it, own it, and operate it. So, with all of this said, uh, I, you know, the elephant in the room that uh, I'd like to acknowledge is obviously you know, the, the last week's decision by the Public Service Commission, which denied, you know, the, the Renewable Energy Developers request for financial relief, uh, which, re, which is related to inflation and rising supply chain costs. And that is, uh, you know, that, that decision from the Public Service Commission is to preserve the integrity of our competitive procurement process uh, and protect ratepayers. Uh, you know, this is obviously very, uh, meaningful for the large scale renewable industry in general and my, and my and my portfolio, as you can imagine, but I do want to assure you that Governor Hochul, New York State and NYSERDA uh, are more resolute than ever before in our clean energy work uh, as we continue to witness the devastating impacts of climate change. And we are committed to supporting large scale renewable energy projects and the launch of this solicitation is just one signal to that demonstrate this commitment. Now, our next steps uh, in general for the large scale industry is to assess the impacts on our portfolio and our contracts. And we'll be working hand in hand with the Department of Public Service and with the renewable energy industry to proceed swiftly with an accelerated procurement process that prioritizes competition, simplifies bid requirements, incorporates inf inflation indexing, includes critical labor protections, and doing all of this while coordinating with all the transmission planning initiatives that we have planned in the states. Now, in addition to this, we, we also recently concluded our offshore wind and land based renewables procurements, and we're going to be making awards announcements in the near future that we're very, very excited about and more information information to come on that very shortly. Um, and but all these efforts that I just mentioned are part of a comprehensive 10 point action plan that the governor released last week. And it outlines how we will expand and support the growing large scale renewable industry in New York and and how we plan to overcome these recent macroeconomic and inflationary challenges that, imp that, are, that are impacting the renewable sector. So I highly encourage you to review that plan if you haven't yet, but I'm sure you have, uh, you know, many questions about what I've just shared and, and what the news you know, this news means for the large scale renewable energy community in New York. Um, you know, I can assure that there will be opportunities to communicate with NYSERDA on these topics in the coming days and the coming weeks, and we will continue open communication with the renewable energy development community. So please be on the lookout for uh, some updates very shortly on what next steps look like. Uh, we're, we're working diligently on that as we speak. So nevertheless, we don't want last week's decision to detract from this exciting opportunity, which is the first build ready project RFP. You know, the build ready team has worked very hard over the last two years to, de to develop and de risk the Benson Mines project. And in particular, the build ready team has done four things for this specific project. Number one, uh, we've entered into an exclusive lease option agreement with Benson Mines. Number two, we've fully permitted the project with the Adirondack Park Agency. Number three, we finalized the system impact study and initiated the facility studies with the New York ISO. And number four, uh, we're working with the St. Lawrence County Industrial Development Agency to do two things. Um, one, advance the project's pilot agreement, and two, establish a host community improvement benefit fund, which would be managed by the St. Lawrence County Industrial Development Agency. So in addition to all of that, um, NYSERDA included in this Benson Mines uh, solicitation an inflation adjustment mechanism and an inter interconnection cost adjustment mechanism, uh, which would be included in the Tier 1 REC contract in order to share the risks of the final development and construction milestones of the project. So, you know, all in all, you know, this build ready solicitation 
uh, you know, NYSERDA is offering an excellent opportunity to the renewable energy development community to partner with us to secure a REC contract and to construct and own operate the very first build ready project for the state. And in our webinar today, we look forward to providing you with more details about the project and more details about the RFP process. And, uh, you know, collectively, as the build ready team, as the large scale renewables team, and as NYSERDA, we're really eager uh, to have many of you. Uh, participate in our step 1 eligibility application. So uh, I want to thank you for your interest. I'm eager to see uh, what comes out of this RFP and I'm very excited uh, about and very proud of the build ready team for all the phenomenal work they're doing. And this is the very first RFP of many to come. So thank you all. And I'd like to hand it over back to Tammy Chesson, who's the program manager for the build ready program. And she's going to be provide, providing you with more, more additional background on the program and this RFP. So thank you all. Great. Thank you, George. Um, next slide, please. And next slide again. Great. So George already provided um, some information in his um, opening remarks about the program. Um, but for any of you that are new to the program, um, really our overall objective is to identify and advance um, sites for large scale renewable energy with a focus on brownfield sites, uh, previously commercial and industrial use sites, um, dormant electric generating stations, um, the parking lots, uh, really sites in the state that private sector wouldn't necessarily go after because of cost and risk um, and focus on large scale renewable energy development. Um, and through that process, um, our overall goal is to bring benefits to the communities where these projects are being hosted. Um, so the program was established in 2020. Um, and then in 2021, um, that's really when we shifted into implementation mode. And since then we've uh, hit the ground running um, and have been working on advancing sites. And here we are um, in the fall of 2023, um, issuing our first request for proposal for the Benson Lens project. Next slide. Um, so overall, the main goals of um, this auction or request for proposal process that we're going to be talking about, we kind of use the term auction in RFP interchangeably, um, but there's two um, overarching goals. Um, the first is we are looking to competitively select um, an awardee to transfer the membership interest in um, the project company that holds the assets um, of the BR facility, um, which is the Benson Mines project. You'll also hear us likely interchangeably using the term BR facility or Benson Mines project. Um, they're referring to the same thing. Um, through a membership interest purchase agreement. And then we're also looking to competitively procure tier one recs from the awardee um, and enter into a 20 year agreement to purchase those tier one, one recs generated by the VR facility, the Best Mines project. Next slide, please. Um, so, overall, the way that our um, auction process is structured, um, and this is how it's worked with Benson Mines and how we envision it will work with um, the uh, upcoming request for proposals that uh, Build Ready will be doing for other projects um, is that we first, um, when we're preparing a project to go out um, for uh, auction, we can issue a request for information to the marketplace where we can share some um, initial information about the project, ask some questions, and gather feedback. We did that for Benson Mines um, last summer. Um, then, once we've uh, developed the project to a point where the team deems it's ready to go out for auction, will then be issuing a request for proposals. Um, right now, we're issuing just a Benson Mines as a single project. In the future, um, we aim to um, issue requests for proposals for portfolios of projects. Um, we'll always uh, be using a two-step process. The first step will be this eligibility application round where we'll be um, looking for proposers to demonstrate that they meet minimum eligibility qualifications that we lay out. Then the second step is those who demonstrate that they meet those requirements, um, they'll be invited to the step two bid proposal, which is a competitive step where um, you'll be developing and submitting um, a bid proposal to meet the requirements we've outlined, as well as a bid price. We'll evaluate and um, based on non-price and price factors and then award the project to the highest ranked proposer. We'll then shift into awarding, contracting, and transferring the project to the awardee uh, via the MIPA. Um, and then at that point, the project will transfer into the kind of project management, monitoring and reporting, um, specifically with the tier one program here at NYSERDA, who currently oversees and manages the uh, tier one contracts with existing uh, projects in New York. Um, and Build Ready will continue to 
to be involved, but it will be managed by the tier one program. Next slide. Um, so with that overview, I'm going to shift it over to my colleague Gillian Black, who's going to um, give us some background on the Benson Mines um, project. Hi, thank you all for joining us. George did a great job of introducing the program and where we are uh, with this project. And um, I'm going to dig in a little bit to the specific site and project itself. Um, all of this information will be available to you, this webinar in particular. Um, those who are invited into step two will have access to a data room, which will include all the stuff we've got here. But just to give you a bit of a more detailed look at the project. Next slide, please. So Benson Mines is a 12 megawatt project. It's PV only. Uh, it's up in the town of Clifton in St. Lawrence County in the Adirondack Park. Uh, it is sited on an iron tailings pile. Um, the mine is no longer operating as an iron mine. Um, it is operating their, their uh, clearing timber and they're running a granite aggregate business. Um, the red outline polygon there represents the total project area that we've got under lease option for a full 20 megawatt project. We have negotiated a lease option agreement with Benson Mines and um, ultimately the awardee will uh, finalize the designs, go to construction drawings, pull permits, et cetera, and the lease premises will get adjusted based on their needs. Um, as I mentioned, it was a 20 megawatt project to begin with. We scaled it back to 12 and we've redesigned at 12, done the PV sets for 12, et cetera. And that'll all be shared with folks. Um, we've done the wetland delineation. We're out of wetlands, so there's no issues there. Um, as I mentioned, we, we, uh, we permitted it for 12, or sorry, 20, and now it's at 12. Uh, the reason we dropped to 12, uh, is that we ran into some non-local upgrades during our SIS. And instead of going into a large generator process and going through a class year study, we chose to stick with 12, avoid the non-local upgrades, get it to market sooner and at a lower cost. Um, it's been approved, uh, planning approval came from Adirondack Park Association and the town of Clifton. Um, so we're all set there. Next slide, please. Right. This map here, you've got it. The inset on the bottom of this image shows the reduced 12 megawatt layout, uh, interconnection on the upper right of that inset. The larger image, you can see the various substations in the area focus in on the Star Lake substation on the bottom right corner. You can see that we're going in a single line tap into the Star Lake substation. Benson Mine site is in the green highlighted area. Um, let's see, we've got the final SIS. Uh, that'll be in the data room. And we've entered into the facility study at the 12. Um, there's the potential to increase the size beyond 12. Um, that depends on on what those lines in that substation can take. It's unclear it might they might be able to take a little bit more than 12, maybe up to 15. Um, and with some non-local upgrades, if the utility conducts those upgrades, there may be the potential to run a phase two project build here and get up to 20 megawatts, but that's yet to be determined and would happen post transfer. Uh, as George mentioned, we've been negotiating the pilot with the IDA. We've got terms in front of the school district and the town. The IDA is in the middle of that. We suspect that'll get wrapped up while we're conducting this RFP process. Um, post community engagement, we conducted um, meetings with the local communities and ultimately landed on a community benefit fund that will be administered by 
the IDA, and it's essentially a micro grant program to provide funding for local area businesses with, uh, with a particular emphasis on low to moderate income businesses. Um, the IDA has a similar program for another cross section of the population and we're targeting this. So uh, they've been fantastic to work with and we're really happy to, to provide that in this package to you guys. Next slide, please. Okay, milestones, completed, remaining, and who's responsible for what? Um, we formed the LLC. Uh, we will transfer the LLC and all the assets, et cetera, through the MIPA. Um, there's an election, we can go into more detail on that later, but uh, the buyer, the winner, the awardee will have to classify what type of project co they are. That'll happen post-transfer. Um, we've got the lease option agreement inked, we've got title commitment. Um, the awardee will be responsible for exercising the option and commencing the lease. We've been paying the lease option payments and will continue to do so until transfer. Um, site map, we've got an Alta built out. It's not in a final draft format. We're waiting for the awardee to come and finalize their designs and then they can define the lease premises, provide written descriptions, et cetera, and, and close the Alta. Um, we'll provide the 12 megawatt layout, uh, APA subdivision map, Alta study area, et cetera. So again, we've, we've created an entire area that is sufficient for a 20 megawatt project that is included in the lease as included in the uh, permitting, et cetera. In terms of design, you can see there, I'm not going to read them out, but We've completed all of these items as a normal developer would. Um, some will need updating. Uh, we're, we're renewing the phase one ESA right now as we speak. Uh, you know, we'll provide a decom plan, PV cysts and, and the uh, P50s um, for the 12 megawatt. I believe we're also including it for a 20, to check on that. Um, provide everything in CAD, got the SWIP set up for our design, but that'll obviously need to change if folks or the awardee decides to change the layout. Um, so once we award the project, you know, during this RFP process, you'll have a chance to redesign and, and present to us your own design, but ultimately uh, it's up to you once you take on the project, what you're gonna do with it. Next slide, please. Okay, permitting. All of these things have been done. The the uh, driveway permits, the perm 32 and 33 are in progress. We've got that all teed up. Um, that'll be the responsibility of the awardee to take it from there. Obviously, the awardee will pull the speedies permit um, and then the building permit itself after they you develop the construction drawings, get those squared away. Um, Town of Clifton's been great to work with. St. Lawrence County's been fantastic to work with. Interconnection is mentioned, SIS is finalized, facility study in progress. Uh, we anticipate entering into the expedited delivery study for, for capacity. Uh, I believe it's gonna open up later this winter, early spring, so we'll take care of that, get it going. And obviously the interconnection agreement with uh, you know, NISO and National Grid, the awardee will be responsible for that. And that'll be a major milestone that you'll see in our, in our RFP docs. Um, pilot in process. Uh, we're going to take it through, but you guys will execute it ultimately. Um, but I dare say this fall, we'll, we'll get that squared away if everything goes well. Um, host community benefit, we've established the program with the SLC IDA and uh, upon transfer of the BR asset, uh, you know, part of, in addition to paying a dev fee to us, taking ownership of the project, you'll also fund the fund with the 200K. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm gonna hand it back to Emily. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Gilly. Yeah. Um, all right, so now that you all have a little bit more context about the Benson Mines project and what we are selling, um, we are going to shift more back into the request for proposal process and stuff. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this is a high level schedule 
um, we issued our request for proposals on October 2nd. Um, right now, this DEF 1 eligibility application is open. Um, applications are due on December 7th at 3 p.m. Um, Eastern. Uh, we'll then evaluate uh, the step one um, applications and we will issue notice of qualifications uh, to those who um, have qualified um, on January 11th. Um, and at that point in time, you will be invited into the Benz and Mines data room where you will receive um, all of the detailed data and documentation, um, particularly that Gillian was walking through in the previous slides um, to start forming your uh, step two bid proposal. Um, you'll then have time to work on your bid proposal um, for those who have been invited. That will also be an option to ask questions with ICERTA. There'll be a webinar. Um, the step two bid proposals and bid prices will be due March 14th. We'll then uh, work towards our bid evaluation um, and review um, with the aim of awarding um, in Q2 2024 and hoping to wrap up contracting and transfer by Q3 2024. Next slide, please. Um, so this slide is a little bit detailed, but it does um, replicate a lot of the information that's in the RFP um, and also is up on our RFP webpage. Um, and it basically lays out what is required for each step of the process. Um, so as I mentioned before, for this current phase, we're in the step one eligibility application. This is really a minimum, a minimum qualifications round. Um, it's not the full bid proposal. Um, so what we are looking for you to submit to us by December 7th at 3 p.m. is a step one eligibility application form. That is a Excel workbook that has been posted on the Build Ready RFP webpage, um, and it's called Appendix 1. Um, there's a number of sheets that you'll need to fill out. We'll be going through those in the next couple of slides. Um, then we're asking you to upload what we're calling the step one application narrative. Um, there's a few different uh, narratives um, and attachments that we're requesting as part of the step one eligibility application, including project team description and structure, your key personnel um, and other personnel resumes, um, previous project experience and references, and your financial qualifications. Um, there then is also a step one proposal certification form, which is called Appendix 2, a non disclosure agreement, um, which we are requiring, um, Appendix 3. Um, executive order number 16 certification form, um, which basically says that um, entities contracting with uh, NYSERDA are not doing business uh, with Russia. And then executive order number 192, um, which uh, lays out kind of a number of responsibilities that we uh, require vendors um, to demonstrate. Um, these are normal contracting documents that anybody needs to pull out with NYSERDA. It's not uh, specific to this RFP process. Um, and then uh, we highly encourage you to consult the step one eligibility application checklist that we uh, developed for this process. And then finally, an optional, which we'll get into a little bit more, is you can submit a markup of uh, the draft rec agreement and MIPA, which are also posted on the Build Ready webpage. Um, I am not going to walk through step two right now. We have some more slides on that. Uh, I'd like to go to the next slide and talk a little bit more about um, step one. Um, okay, so requirements for step one. Uh, next slide. So step one is open to anyone who's interested in this project. Um, you need to provide um, some information to us. Um, so the first thing that we're asking for is a project team description um, and a description of the structure of the project team. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's kind of two main components to the step one application, it's this application narrative, which we're requesting, and then the eligibility application form that you need to fill out. Um, for the project team description and structure, um, this is really just explaining to us um, who's making up your project team. We um, are allowing teaming um, and, or ju ju joint venturing um, to provide uh, the main services that we need to see um, for this project. Um, so your team, needs to demonstrate that it can design and engineer this project, secure the financing for it, procure the major equipment, construct it, own and operate the facility. It doesn't need to be the same entity that does uh, all of these things. You can team with different organizations with subcontractors to do this. But if you do not demonstrate that your team can do all of these things, you will not uh, be considered eligible. Um, so uh, we wanna see a narrative of describing the team um, as well as an organizational chart 
during the relationship among the project team organizations. Um, and then you need to fill out the step one um, eligibility application form, uh, part one, the team, the project team worksheet. Next slide. Um, this is just a snapshot of that um, step one eligibility application form that I've been referencing. Um, it is an Excel workbook, as I said, the first sheet is a user guide that just provides explanation of how to fill it out. And next slide. And then this is a snapshot of the project team uh, description <coughs> um, sheet. So you'd be filling out uh, basic information of the main proposer. So this is the lead, um, uh, lead project team um, organization their authorized representative, and then the other uh, project team entities that would be making up that team um, and outlining what role each of uh, those uh, organizations entities will be having. Next slide, please. The next thing that we're requiring for step one is um, providing us with key personnel, um, and then you can also provide um, other personnel. Uh, this is not required, it's optional. Um, this information could then be used for your step two bid proposal um, if you're qualified. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but what is required and must be submitted with your step one um, eligibility application um, is you need to identify three uh, main key personnel, project manager, a design and engineering team lead, and a construction team lead. Um, and in identifying these people, they have um, some minimum eligibility qualifications that they need to meet. Um, they have to have at least two years of experience developing two megawatt AC or larger solar PV projects during the last five years. Um, so that needs evidence needs to be demonstrated. Um, that will be uh, demonstrated through both the step one eligibility form. Um, there is a part two, which is where you keep providing information on uh, the key and other personnel, um, as well as through your step one application narrative. Um, where you will be providing the resumes and qualifications of those individuals. Um, we are also requesting a management chart that illustrates the relationships among the personnel. Um, and then the final um, minimum eligibility qualification that you will need to demonstrate is that the design, lead te design team lead either has to be a licensed professional engineer um, in the state of New York, or uh, is eligible for licensure in the state of New York within 12 months of the bid proposal due date. So we'll want uh, documentation of um, any New York state licenses or demonstration that those licenses could be um, achieved. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is just a snapshot of the uh, worksheet within the step one eligibility application form. Um, and uh, the information that you will need to provide on the uh, three different key personnel. This is just an example of the project manager, and there's more fields available in the in the form. Next slide. So the next um, requirement for step one um, is providing uh, previous project experience and references. Um, and so this is also within the step one eligibility form um, worksheet. Uh, this is part three, um, and in particular. Um, we are requesting uh, project references that need to demonstrate that the project team has experience in designing, securing finance, or constructing and operating at least one solar PV project of at least uh, two megawatts AC. Um, you can provide more than one reference. This is just the bare minimum. Um, if you don't demonstrate this, then you would not qualify um, for, uh, for step two. Next slide, please. Uh, and then this is a snapshot of, again, the worksheet that will need to be filled out. These are just some of the fields that we will be asking for. There are a number of other fields um, that just didn't fit on the slide. But you can take a look at the, the workbook. It's available on the, the Build Ready website. Next slide. Um, so the next requirement for step one are financial qualifications. Um, so what we are asking for you to provide us in the step one application narrative um, we are requesting a letter from a commercial bank or another financial institution confirming that it's prepared to issue a letter of credit or contract security of um, $1.5 million. We're also requesting a letter from a commercial bank or other financial institution um, demonstrating that it's prepared to issue a performance bond or other guarantee of $30 million. 
Um, we're also requiring you to upload um, your most recent um, audited financial statement um, and um, unaudited, unaudited financial statements um, for the quarters um, that have proceeded until your next audited financial statement is due. Um, and then if your company has a credit rating, we're asking you to provide that rating to us. If, if it does not, then you can just say we're unrated. Um, and so to demonstrate the minimum eligibility qualifications are met um, for uh, this requirement, you have to provide the letters of credit to the financial statements and let us know about um, your credit rating. Uh, next slide. So there's a couple other requirements um, for this step, which I mentioned um, earlier on that overview slide. Um, so we are requiring you, the authorized representative of the um, lead team um, to submit a step one proposal certification form appendix two. Um, there's a couple different um, types of information that you're certifying uh, when that form is signed, uh, basically certifying that the um, lead organization is an accredited investor, um, that you signed CS force labor prevention, um, that uh, the Project, the key personnel project team members have my NISO access and um, that there's no conflicts of interest amongst uh, the organization. Um, there's been no collusion that's taken place in preparing your uh, submission, um, that you're complying with state finance law sections 139J and 139K, um, and that there's currently uh, no defaults um, within the business. Um, then again, a non disclosure agreement. Um, and executive order number 16 and executive order number 192. Um, and then this is optional for, um, for this entire process, whether step one or step two. Um, but if you wanted to at step one, you could submit a markup of the REC and MIPO agreement um, with your red lines and a memo outlining um, any terms of um, concern. Um, but that, and that can be submitted now or uh, no later than the step two bid proposal due date. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm now going to briefly go over how step one um, eligibility applications will be evaluated. Uh, next slide. So this step is a pass fail step. We are not going to be scoring um, the submissions that we received. Um, we are going to be looking at the information that you submit, evaluating against those min minimum eligibility qualifications that are outlined. Um, if you have submitted information that meets those, your application will pass and you will be submit, you will be invited into step two. If we review your information and there are um, requirements that you have failed, um, we will give you an opportunity to cure those deficiencies. Also, if there's things that we just find unclear, we will also give you an opportunity to cure those deficiencies. Um, we'll give you a one-time chance. Um, and then you'll need to resubmit your application. Um, if those deficiencies have been cured, you will then uh, pass and be invited to step two. Um, if uh, you're not able to cure those deficiencies, then you will not be able to be invited to step two and will not uh, pass the minimum eligibility uh, round. Um, those who are uh, who do pass will be invited into step two um, and uh, begin the process of developing the bid proposal um, and will get access to um, our data room uh, where all the detailed information on the project will be provided. Um, if you do not make it to step two, you are welcome to request a debrief from NYSERDA. Um, and uh, we're happy to do that with you all. Um, and for those that do make it to step two, there will be another webinar um, that will be open just to the eligible proposers. We've tentatively scheduled, tentatively scheduled that for January 23rd. Um, next slide. So now I'm going to pass it over to Bram. He's going to go through the process of actually uploading your um, eligibility application into uh, NYSERDA's uh, Salesforce system. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Bram Peterson with NYSERDA Large Scale Renewables team. Um, again, these slides will be posted for reference, so I invite you to you know use these as you're walking through the application. But we'll just spend a few minutes walking through what you'll see if you can submit a step one application. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so if you follow the prompts on our Benson Mines RFP web page, that'll take you to our step one apply online button. Um, for those of you joining us that have participated in other nice sort of programs in the past, this portal may look familiar. Um, we're going to be referring to it as, as the NYSERDA portal. Um, this will be the same uh, portal that you use to submit step one. And if you're eligible to proceed to step two, ultimately the step two bid. Um, if you've used this portal before, you're welcome to use those same credentials that you have for other New York or NYSERDA programs, such as New York Sun. Um, but otherwise, it's a pretty um, seamless process to set up a new account and start an application. Um, very much encourage everyone to do this step early such that you can reach out to us in, uh, well in advance of the submission deadline if you run into any issues when setting up an account and starting an application. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so once you've created an account or logged into an existing account, it will um, automatically start a step one application. Um, unless you're filling out the entire thing and submitting it in one go, which we do not recommend. Um, as you come back to it to complete the application, when you sign in, you'll see uh, a previously started application from your view. Um, if for whatever reason you need to start a new uh, step one application, that option is also available to you. And then ultimately we'll walk through all these steps, but once the step one application is submitted, you'll be able to come back and confirm that status for yourself by logging in with the same login that you just submitted the application. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so you'll see here that this is showing a screenshot of step one of five. Um, you'll see five key steps as you walk through. Step one is just collecting the um, contact information. This would be great to get the primary contact that we'll be coordinating with on the application. And please also ensure to list the authorized representative here just so that we can tie that to the step one application form that Emily previewed earlier. Next slide, please. Um, we'll just be seeking to intake some identifying information on this slide. It does not need to be too extensive. This is just so that we can easily identify the application once it's on the side of the uh, uh, Salesforce system once it's submitted. Um, next slide, please. This step three of five is really the key component of the application. So on this step, you will be uploading all of those required documents that Emily just previewed. Um, five of these six required documents are templates that are provided by NYSERDA and they're all on our website. So please go and download and review those as soon as you can. And then the step one eligibility application form narrative upload field is really the most substantive piece of the application. This is where we'll be asking you to demonstrate that you meet all of those minimum eligibility qualifications that Emily previewed. And you'll be able to upload all these files here and continue on. Next slide, please. Um, step four of five is going to be a review screen where you'll just see all the information that you've submitted to date. And I'm welcome you to you know, take some screenshots here because after you move to step five, which is really just the submission button, um, you will not have access to what you previously uploaded. So again, uh, I encourage you all to do that here. It'll be a testing and and signing for submitting as well. But again, we ask that you also upload the certification form as part of that step three uploads page. Um, and when submitted, you'll be able to, like I mentioned, log in and see that status of submitted. Um, for those proposers that are found to be eligible to move to step two, um, we'll be demoing um, in January a similar process for submitting the step two portion. Uh, next slide, please. And one more, thanks. So here's just a look at um, some of our upcoming deadlines. Thank you for the folks that have submitted some questions so far. Again, I hope to, we're covering some of these as we go, but please feel free to submit questions today. Um, for any questions that wanna be submitted after the fact, we have a few milestones here where we'll be posting responses online for all uh, interested parties to view. Um, and again, the most critical date here is that December 7th, December 7th, excuse me, deadline for submitting the step one eligibility application. So again, please um, familiarize yourself with the nice sort of portal, get logged in or re-logged in and uh, reach out to us early if you have any issues with starting that application. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, I think I'm going to pass back to Emily to preview some of the step two portion of the process. Great, thanks, Bram. Um, so the majority of this webinar has focused on step one, but we do want to preview um, some of the step two requirements. Um, so that's what we'll be doing the next couple slides. Um, so next slide, please. So we already covered the step one eligibility application, shifting into step two bid proposal. So those of you that are qualified um, will be um, receive your notice of qualification. You'll receive an invite to the data room. And then here are the uh, requirements for the step two uh, bid proposal. Um, so there is also a step two bid proposal form, appendix five, that's currently available on the build ready. Um, website, so you can take a look at that. That does not need to be filled out at this point. It's just there for you to understand what will be required of you um, when we get to that stage. Um, if you get to that stage, um, any updates to the proposer qualifications, if it's applicable, we'll get into that a little bit more below. Um, the step two bid proposal narrative. Um, the main thing that we are requiring there is we are looking for a project execution plan. Um, to be developed and submitted by um, the proposer. Um, and there are a number of sections uh, required as part of the project execution plan, as you can see on this slide. Um, and then also we are looking for uh, the proposer to submit new or additional incremental economic benefits um, that the proposer could bring to New York State beyond what the Build Ready team has already secured for the project. Um, you'll need to submit a project bid fee um, in advance of the bid proposal submission date. Um, as part of your bid uh, proposal, you'll also be submitting to us your bid price um, for your uh, proposal, um, a step two proposal certification form, and um, a markup mark up of agreements if you uh, decide to do so. Next slide. Um, so as it relates to the proposal qualifications, um, We'll be using the information provided in the step 1 eligibility application to evaluate the proposer qualifications. Um, and so the things that we are requesting in step 1 is the project team description and structure, key personnel and other personnel and previous project experience and references. Um, if you receive a notice of qualification and you need to revise um, your uh, proposer qualifications, um, specifically, if you need to revise any of the key personnel that were submitted. Um, as part of your step 1 eligibility application um, or your project experience, um, we are requiring that you notify us that you need to make those changes and receive our written authorization to make that change. Um, this is a particular, you know, we are going to be evaluating your bid proposals based on the people you're putting forward. Um, if you're going to be changing people out, we need to know and understand that and authorize you to do so. Um, so, um, based on our consent to do so, you can then, um, update this information prior to submitting your step two bid proposal. Um, and we'll pre-populate that step two bid proposal form for you um, and send it back to you um, so you can make those, those uh, approved changes. So changes can be made, you just need to get our uh, permission before doing so. Next slide, please. So the project execution plan. Um, we, as I said, we're requesting that bid proposals include a step-by-step -step plan and a schedule. Um, as well um, as a budget to complete the remaining uh, project development requirements um, for the project, including final design, securing financing for construction ownership and operation, eventually decommissioning of the facility. Um, and so there's a number of um, parts of the plan um, that we are looking for you to uh, submit as part of your bid proposal. So we're looking for preliminary engineering procurement and construction plan, um, your energy production estimate in big quantity. Um, so that's your PV SIST report. Um, your project schedule, um, a project budget and uh, major cost assumptions, a financing plan, a labor plan, a community engagement plan, an operations and maintenance plan, and a decommissioning plan. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to Bram to talk about uh, new or additional incremental economic benefits. Great, thanks. So this is another key component um, of the step two bid proposal process that uh, would be great if anyone interested in bidding starts thinking about today. So similar to our other large scale renewable programs, um, a key component of how we'll conduct evaluation will be based on 
the level to which each proposer is willing to commit to spending incremental economic benefits um, on expenditures or services in New York State. Um, so I invite you to take a read of the RFP, which um, details some examples of these eligible expenditures and greater length. Um, those items in the RFP are including, but not limited to, you know, invite you all to think about outside the box types of economic benefits. So long as they are in fact, direct economic benefits, um, but by and large, they can be categorized into long term economic benefits. These are, you know, going to be lasting longer than 3 years, long term payments and long term jobs and short term economic benefits. Ones lasting less than 3 years that will likely be more related to the uh, final stages of development and construction of the facility. Um, again, we understand that we have a, a range of interested parties that are going to be participating in the RFP. So whether or not you are based in New York state, we invite you to, you know, explore as many avenues as possible to direct these types of expenditures associated with the project in New York state. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, just a few other notes here. Um, Gillian mentioned earlier that we already have some long term economic benefits underway as part of the project's development. So, those will be incorporated into the awarded rec agreement. Um, but again, we invite um, all proposers to explore additional um, benefits that they can commit to or commitments to sourcing labor, construction services, et cetera, from within New York beyond what NYSERDA has already completed. Again, just reiterating that these are going to be direct economic benefits that are ultimately codified in the tier one rec agreement that the awarded proposer would be executing. Um, and additionally, we detail this further, in the, or further, excuse me, in the RFP as well. But um, for any proposer that can commit to directing benefits to these priority groups that NYSERDA on behalf of New York State is seeking to target as we um, build up this part of the program, those expenditures will be, receive greater weighting in evaluation, um, and those proposers committing to those types of benefits will be more favorably evaluated. So these are economic benefits that can be directed to minority and woman-owned businesses, service-disabled veteran-owned businesses, or businesses or individuals um, residing in New York's disadvantaged communities. Um, so again, we. Uh, Realize that there's a range of different benefits and expenditures that are going to be associated with this project from when it changes hands from NYSERDA to the ultimate awardee. And some of this is easier or less easy to plan at this stage in the game. But, you know, with a number of months prior to the step two bid proposal on our hands right now, really invite all of you to think about how you might be able to go about directing these types of projects spent expenditures both in New York and to these groups that we want to make sure are um, playing a role in this project and in this program as it goes forward. Next slide, please. Okay, and then uh, one of the most critical components of this auction is the bid price that gets submitted. So Emily mentioned we use auction and solicitation a bit interchangeably, but ultimately this is a competitive solicitation whereby we'll be evaluating fixed competitive bids that are submitted by each participating proposer um, that would be incorporated into the awarded rec agreement. Um, so for those of you that are unfamiliar with NYSERDA's rec agreement structure, um, we are paying for the renewable energy certificates that are going to be produced by this project. And what you as a proposer are bidding to NYSERDA is the price that we would be paying you um, for each megawatt hour, each rec generated once the project is operational. Um, we accept fixed rec bids, which is one fixed nominal dollar value for the life of the contract, which is going to be 20 years that's um, contracted for the awarded proposer. Um, and starting in 2020, we also made available the index rec pricing structure for interested parties that are looking to seek a contract with the index rec pricing settlement. Um, there's a illustrative view on the right hand side of the screen now, but at the simplest level, instead of paying one fixed dollar amount per rec that's generated, um, the proposer you bid a fixed strike price for the 20 year term in nominal dollars. And each month, um, NYSERDA nets out a proxy for the energy and capacity value that the project would be receiving in their NISO zone 
the reference energy price and the reference capacity price such that if energy and capacity prices rise, um, the rec price paid to you, the counterparty falls. And on the inverse, if energy and capacity prices are lower, the index rec price is higher. Um, this was a pricing construct instituted by the Public Service Commission a few years ago to help risk share with our counterparties and protect ratepayers from volatile energy and capacity prices in the future. It is a unique um, pricing structure. So if this is some, something that you're interested in and not something that you've um, familiarized with yourself before, I uh, invite you to carefully read this section of the RFP and the agreement itself, um, Article 5 explicitly to see how this settlement occurs, um, Article 4 and 5, um, such that you understand what uh, you are committing to if seeking an index rec uh, tier 1 agreement. Um, and maybe most importantly, NYSERDA cannot adjust the awarded uh, rec price except under a very limited set of circumstances, which Emily is going to preview next. But otherwise, your bid price is your bid price. We ask that you take care in submitting that bid price to NYSERDA. Uh, Emily? Okay. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? So, as Bram was just saying, um, your bid price bid price is um, fixed when you submit it to NYSERDA as part of your step to bid form. There are two adjustment mechanisms, though, that we um, have included um, in our request for proposal and in our rec agreement that we'll be signing with um, the awardee. Um, so I would like to go over those. Um, the first adjustment that will be permitted um, is an inflation risk adjustment. Um, as Graham noted, we are requiring bidders to submit two bid prices to us. One is one is a inflation adjusted bid price and one is a non inflation adjusted bid price. Um, we'll evaluate bid prices that we receive. Um, and if the inflation adjusted bid price is selected, um, there will be an opportunity for the awardee to come back to NYSERDA to have the bid price that we've contracted with you all to be adjusted. Um, to account for any inflation uh, between the bid proposal submission due date and the commencement of construction activities related to the Benson Mines project, the, the BR facility. Um, and this is really to um, help manage um, some of the risks that have been taking place in the marketplace um, with uh, inflation trends um, taking place. Um, and so uh, this slide just re references the section within um, the RFP and then within the rec agreement to review um, to understand um, how that adjustment will take place. Um, and that also the inflation adjustment is going to be based on the PPI um, all commit commodities index. Uh, next slide, please. So the second mechanism um, that we are permitting um, that will allow um, the rec bid price to be adjusted after um, the bid proposal um, is submitted and we will have contracted with NYSERDA as the awardee is through um, an interconnection cost adjust adjustment. Um, and basically um, what this is allowing is that once uh, the final interconnection cost allocation is known, um, the bid price that you submit to us, whether that's fixed or indexed, um, can be adjusted to account for any change um, in the interconnection cost allocation um, between what is the final interconnection cost allocation and the interconnection cost allocation baseline. Um, so it's important to understand these definitions of interconnection cost allocation and interconnection cost allocation baseline and what um, will be permitted to be adjusted. So could you please go to the next slide, Sal? Thank you. Um, so for the interconnection cost allocation baseline, this is the interconnection cost estimate that we, NYSERDA, will be providing to you um, that was provided to us um, by the NISO in our system impact study. Um, this will be provided uh, to uh, proposers that qualify for step two in the data room. Um, will also be populated in um, Appendix 5, which we'll be providing to you all um, at, at that point in time. So that interconnection cost is what we consider the interconnection cost allocation baseline for this project. The interconnection cost allocation. Um, so this has two different interconnection cost 
um, associated with this definition. Um, and so there are mandatory interconnection costs and what we call um, approved discretionary interconnection costs. So the mandatory interconnection costs are going to be all the interconnection costs that are actually paid by the awardee um, that are required um, by the CTO um, in the interconnection agreement. Um, these are going to be the required interconnection upgrades for the project. So no project can take place unless these upgrades um, happen. There's then a second type of uh, costs that we've defined. These are the approved discretionary interconnection costs. So these would be costs that the awardee um, could pay for the project that would be um, interconnection costs that might not be required by the interconnection agreement, but the awardee would like to under, undertake um, for some reason for the project. Um, these types of costs could potentially be um, undertaken, but they need to be approved by NYSERDA. If, if these are not reviewed and approved by NYSERDA, then they would uh, not be considered approved discretionary interconnection costs. Um, so the interconnection cost allocation is the aggregate of all of the mandatory interconnection costs. So these are the required interconnection costs under the interconnection agreement, plus any approved discretionary interconnection costs, which the awardee has um, selected to move forward that have been approved by NYSERC. I realize that's a lot. <laughs> um, could you go back to the previous slide, Sal? Um, and again, this is all outlined in the RFP and in the REC agreement. Um, so you can go back and refer to those documents. But basically what we're saying is if that final interconnection cost allocation is greater than the interconnection cost allocation baseline. So if it's greater than what um, we uh, put forward from the system impact study, the index rec strike and fixed rec uh, price, depending on what you bid to us, it will be increased to allow um, the awardee to recover 100% of the incremental costs over that 20 year contract tenor. Um, if uh, it turns out that the interconnection cost allocation is actually less than the interconnection cost allocation baseline, um, then that bid price will be reduced in a manner that will allow um, NYSERDA and the awardee to share in those savings. And again, this is all detailed in section 5.03. Um, and exhibit M of the REC agreement um, for the method of calculating this adjustment. Next slide. Um, you can go to the next slide. So really those, just to wrap that up, those are the only two adjustments um, that can take place to your bid price after award, um, the inflation adjustment and the interconnection cost allocation adjustment. Uh, outside of those, uh, there's no changes to the bid price once your bid proposal is, is submitted and, and once a contract is awarded. Um, we mentioned earlier that one of the requirements for step two is also submitting a project bid fee. Um, this needs to be submitted to us prior to um, the step two bid proposal being due um, and directions on how to submit this bid fee will be provided during the step two process. Um, but we have set the bid fee at $100,000. $10,000 of that will be non-refundable. Um, and um, the remaining 90,000 um, for the awardee will go towards uh, their bid deposit. Um, the bid deposit will be credited towards the awardee's payment of the MIPA purchase price or for proposers that are not awarded will be refunded within 180 days of the award notification date. Uh, next slide, please. So, the next thing I want to go over is the MIPA purchase price. So in the request for proposal that's out right now, um, we have set the purchase price for the project um, at uh, $3.4 million. So this is um, basically the price that the awardee will have to pay to NYSERDA at the time of transfer. This price is non-negotiable. Um, this price corresponds to um, our costs to uh, develop the VR facility through the date of purchase under the MIPA. Um, and so there will not be an opportunity to negotiate the purchase price. So if you are um, moving forward with step two, you need to be prepared uh, to, to pay this price to NYSERDA um, at the time of uh, the closing date of the transaction. And it will be due in full at that point in time. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so we've mentioned this a couple of times throughout <laughs> the webinar, uh, but there is an opportunity to mark up the REC agreement and the MIPA agreement in Redline, um, and then submit a, a memo to us um, outlining any of the terms and conditions that um, you wish for clarity on or to negotiate. Um, and so you can submit these markups to us uh, no later than the bid step two bid proposal due date. Um, and um, in the step two certification form that she will also be providing to us um, uh, with the step two bid proposal, uh, basically the authorized representative in that form is going to have to say um, whether they uh, have submitted markups or if they haven't, that they basically accept the terms of um, the REC agreement in the MIPA. Um, and again, this basically just sets out where uh, within the agreement um, uh, where you can go and kind of review uh, the terms of the REC agreement of the MIPA. All right, next slide, please. Um, so I just mentioned this a little bit before the step two proposal certification form um, and what it includes. Um, so basically, uh, the authorized representative would be uh, demonstrating that all statements submitted by the proposer are true and accurate, um, that you'll agree to provide any additional information that we might request from you to, to clarify or confirm um, information on the bid proposal, um, that you understand that NYSERDA, PSC, or an authorized agent could audit the proposer to verify information. Um, you uh, must notify NYSERDA if, if there's any material changes to your bid proposal after submission um, that we will require final verification of the information before um, the first payment would be made under um, a contract awarded with NYSERDA. Um, and the proposer's failure to provide information as requested by NYSERDA could disqualify the bid proposal from consideration. Um, you're going to be certifying there that uh, you're not requesting any changes to the REC agreement and MIPA outside of any red lines that you submitted, um, and that you understand the requirements of BioAmerica and US Iron and Steel, and certify that your bid proposal complies with those requirements, that your EO uh, uh, number 16 that you submitted is still true and accurate from the step one phase, um, and that your bid proposal was um, arrived at independently without Collusion and is a firm and binding offer for at least 180 days. Next slide, please. Um, so now I'm just going to walk through the step two evaluation. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we will first be examining the bid proposals that we receive um, for completeness to confirm that all um, step one minimum eligibility requirements are still met. Um, and that we've received all the information that we've requested as part of the step two bid proposal. Um, if there are any deficiencies or incomplete um, pieces or things that are unclear to us, we will reach out to proposers and you'll have an opportunity to cure those deficiencies um, in the time provided. Um, then once we um, start evaluating the proposals, we'll be evaluating them based on uh, both price and non-price factors. Um, this is a pretty standard for NYSERDA um, solicitations and evaluations. Um, the one thing that you'll see a notable difference is um, from other uh, large-scale renewable solicitations is the weighting assigned to um, the price and non-price evaluation factors um, for the build-ready request for proposal process. So our bid price, uh, we have a weighting of 55% to the overall score. It's still the largest weighting of the overall evaluation, um, but a little bit less than the uh, standard um, tier one and offshore wind um, uh, weighting of price. And then our non-price factors are a little bit higher. Um, the total value of the non-price factors um, we're weighting at 45%. Um, and so this is a little bit higher than you see in the tier one or the um, offshore wind solicitations. Um, and so. The non-price factors are broken out into three main components. Um, this is going to be the incremental economic benefits New York State that Bram mentioned at 15%, the proposer qualifications at 10%, and the project execution plan at 20%. Um, and so we will evaluate both, uh, both on the price and non-price factors, um, rank the proposals, and the highest ranked um, will be uh, contacted for award. Next slide, please. 
Um, so kind of the main next steps and key dates was step two. If you go to the next slide. Um, so if you're invited to step two, you'll receive your notice of qualification on January 11th. And um, you'll also at that point receive your invitation to the data room um, with a step two bid proposal. Uh, as I said before, there'll be a webinar. Um, we'll follow a similar process. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions. We'll provide answers. Um, and then uh, you'll be working on your proposals. Um, and if we need to issue an addendum to the RFP, we have an opportunity to do so. Um, and then the bid fee submission is due a week before the proposals. Um, and then the step two bid proposals will be due March 14th at 3 p.m. Um, that, that will also be updated via Salesforce. We'll go through that process with you all um, when we get to that point, similar to the, how we did today. Um, and then we'll notify the proposal receiving the award in Q2 and um, execute agreements and transfer the project um, within Q3 2024. Next slide, please. So that is um, the material we outlined to cover with you all today. Um, we've received a number of questions. Um, so I think we're gonna go ahead and try to answer some of those. And then um, whatever we're not able to get through we will um, be, as I said, uh, posting a Q&A uh, summary um, after this webinar. So we will um, get to those with a Q&A summary. Um, and then there's still an opportunity to ask questions um, during the step one phase. So if you didn't ask a question now or something comes up later, please submit your questions to us um, to the Build Ready Auction email address um, and we'll do our best to answer those as, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks again for those few that came in already. Um, we had one question about how we're defining large scale solar and how that compares to the commercial two to five megawatt scale. Um, so typically when the build ready program and NYSERDA is going to be talking about large scale, it's going to be five megawatts AC and greater. Those are grid connected projects. That are nice so jurisdictional not your less than five megawatt ac behind the meter so um by and large the build ready program will be targeting that range um five and up as we talk about large scale solar going forward um and another question here uh, i think we covered this pretty extensively about rec prices but um just to hit on this again the, the purchase price has already been set by nicerta so this is not you know a, a component of what you're bidding on or, or what the auction is is seeking for you to bid on. Um, really, the more competitive portion of this is the bid price that you submit to NYSERDA and the 45% the non-price factors that um, Emily outlined as well. And again, just reiterating that the non-price factors do play a materially greater portion of the weighting here. So um, definitely invite everyone to take care in putting together their project execution plan and uh, seeing um, what they can do with their uh, economic benefits New York State package that they can include with their bid. Um, Lee, do you want to share sure. a couple? Yeah, so um, we were asked if the slides will be um, sent out. Um, yes, the slides will be posted to the Build Ready RP page and they will be, um, you will receive a notification when they're posted. Um, we also were asked to clarify the details of the lease option agreement um, and also the um, pilot um, and the host community benefit agreement. Um, we're not going to be talking about the details of the lease option agreement um, or the pilot details. Those will be made available in the step two um, data room and to proposers who are eligible at that stage. Um, however, I can clarify from this question, there was uh, a question around the $200,000 amount that we talked about. So that $200,000 amount that we talked about um, is related to the host community benefit agreement that um, we um, are advancing with the St. Lawrence County IDA. So they're kind of three different things. There's the lease option agreement, um, which we've um, entered into with Benson Mines and have negotiated. There's then the pilot um, agreement um, that we uh, are advancing with the St. Lawrence County IDA 
um, that the awardee will have to enter into. Um, and then there's the host community benefit agreement um, that we've advanced with the St. Lawrence County IDA. And that host community benefit agreement is that as a separate $200,000 that we negotiate with them that the awardee would be responsible for um, paying. Um, there then was a question about whether um, if, if so basically a question about whether um, separate teams can qualify, I think, for step one, and then whether they can move on to step two. Step one is a qualification round. Any proposer who's passed step one will be uh, qualified to enter step two. Yeah. yeah. So we got we've gotten some legal questions in and uh, my name's Nate Chumley. I'm an associate counsel here with the Parks and Renewables. Uh, so the first one was what is the project milestone in which the MIPA will be executed? The membership interest purchase agreement. Um, so it's not directly tied to a development milestone. Following notice of award, uh, we expect the execution of the MIPA within a reasonable time, um, but we'll work with the awarded proposal um, in negotiating the previously submitted red lines. Um, but as we've said, we reserve the right to rescind an award if it is not executed within 180 days of award. The next question, uh, legal related, was can you confirm if the information in the step one application can be kept confidential? Is my sort of plan to share parts of step one application? If so, which parts will be shared? Uh, so, as part of step one, we require proposers to execute the mutual NDA, non disclosure agreements, covering the solicitation. Um, but as stated in section 1.5.6 of the RP, uh, proposers should indicate whether specific information in the either step one application or step bid two bid proposal um, is proprietary or confidential trade secret information. Um, as I assert as subject to, it must comply with the FOIL law, freedom of of information law. Um, so we would advise you when submitting inf information, you should specifically mark all information that you believe uh, should be marked confidential or proprietary. Thanks, Nate. A um, couple others in here. Um, one was uh, asking about provisions for MWBE business entities uh, subcontracting participation from the awarded solar developer. Um, so we did already cover um, the fact that we want anyone to that's proposing to commit to directing benefits to working with these uh, types of business entities in New York State to the maximum extent possible. Um, that will be reflected favorably in evaluation and will go into the awarded contract. Additionally, um, if you take a look at the standard form agreement, um, the awarded counterparty will be reporting to NYSERDA um, quarterly on their efforts to bring the project to construction and commercial operation. And um, among the items that will need to be reported back to us about is all um, efforts being reasonably made to subcontract with um, MWBE entities. Um, so regardless of whether or not you uh, commit to that and have them in your contract, it, it is incumbent on you to take that extra step as part of development and construction. Um, so why not think about it earlier and get credit for it in your bid evaluation? That's why we want to spend time covering that today. So thank you for the question. Um, also got a question about the term concept paper, which you'll see in the step one eligibility application portal. Um, that is a, a term used by NYSERDA uh, across other or programs here. Um, you can, for all intents and purposes, ignore that term. Um, it may say concept paper in certain sections of the step one application, 
but uh, please be sure that it is the step one eligibility application. But thank you for asking the question. Um, all right, we also um, received a question about have the total interconnection upgrade costs been determined? Is the project currently fully permitted? Um, so as uh, Gillian mentioned earlier in his remarks, we have the system impact study, um, which has interconnection cost estimates um, for the project. Um, that will be provided uh, in step two in the data room to those that um, are uh, qualified. Um, and we're also in the pro process of um, the facility study right now, um, and that information should be available by the time that step two data opens up and that will be provided as well. Um, in terms of whether the project's fully permitted, you'll need to go through the status of permitting um, in the earlier slides, so please go ahead and reference those. Uh, but the project is permitted through the APA. Um, it also has received town and county approvals. There are a few outstanding permits that the awardee will be responsible for uh, related to, I think, the state uh, Department of uh, Transportation, the speedies permit, and the building permit. And all that information will be made available in the Step 2 data room. Sorry if you covered this as well, but also confirming that for those eligible proposers that move to step two, the system impact study, which we got a question to about, will also be available in the data room. We received a question about uh, the, this 30 million, uh, elaborating upon a $30 million collateral requirement to participate. What is the basis of that amount? Um, so the RP states that a letter, it, it's, it's a letter from a commercial bank or other financial institution confirming that it would be prepared to issue a performance bond or other guarantee of 30 million to support the proposal if requested. Um, but please note, we are not requiring a performance bond or guarantee to be furnished by the uh, already surety. But we are using the requirement as a means to demonstrate appropriate financial qualifications to award. Great. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for the questions um, that you all submitted. Um, we, as I said, we will be uh, issuing a full uh, Q and A. Um, after the webinar, um, and so any questions we were not able to answer today, um, we will provide answers at that point in time. Um, and we just really want to thank you for your participation. Uh, we're very excited about this request for proposal, um, and we hope that you will participate. Um, if you have any questions that still remain, um, please feel free to reach out to us um, through the Build Ready Auction email address um, and uh, check back to the Build Ready RFP webpage where we be. Uh, providing the webinar recording slides um, and the Q&A. Um, and yeah, we look forward to uh, working with you all. So thank you again for your time and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.